Good morning, church. How are you? Good morning, church. How are you? <laughs> Happy Mother's Day. We are so excited to be here with you all to celebrate. If you would stand as we prepare to worship, turn around and say hi to someone, someone that you know, maybe that you don't know, and tell your favorite mom you love her. Good morning, church. 
How is everybody today? It is a little bit windy and rainy outside, but it is nice in here, and we want to welcome you guys. If it is your first time visiting with us, um, we have a starting point desk out front. You can go out there. You can sign up. We would like to get to lo know a little bit more about you. We will not blow your emails up, I promise. Or if you'd rather do it an easier way, you can scan the QR code on the back of the seat in front of you. Um, there's, also, there's one for um, kind of connecting with the church, and there's also another one for online giving. So you guys can check that out. Uh, it's pretty easy. Even I can do it. So um, just to, <laughs> that's the truth. Uh, a couple other things that we have. Uh, the VBS sign-up board is out here as you walk straight out the double doors. It's over here um, right before you get to the stairwell. So uh, there's some little sheets on there. You just pull one off, sign your child up. It's going to be awesome. We're excited about Bible school this year. If you have any questions, you can see Miss Beth. I think that she's looking for some workers here and there. She always is. So she will put you to work somewhere if you like messing with the kids and, and uh, teaching them. She'll have a place to put you. Other than that, we just want to, again, welcome you guys. Oh, that's right. This rose that's in front of me. We've had a bunch of babies born in the last little bit here at church, and we had two this week. And uh, this rose represents Charlotte Elise Stork, born May 6. Parents are John and Laura Stork. Grandparents are Lido and Stephanie, Stephanie Sullenberger. Uh, Mary Ann Stork. Great grandparents are Harold and Ina Stork. Mike, too. So I'll put Mike in there. Mike's, Mike's in there as well. <laughs> And the Almonds also had an addition. It is, um, I'm going to lose the name, Graham Howard Almond, born this week for Chris and Molly. So uh, they're doing well. Don and Jackie Almond are grandparents, and Jim and Pam Dickerson are also grandparents, and they're proud. Mamas and babies are doing well, so let's give them a hand this morning. And let's pray together this morning. Lord, we just thank you so much for this opportunity to come into your house. Lord, thank you for the new additions uh, to our family here at church with these babies. And, and we're just so excited that moms and babies and dads are doing well. And uh, we just thank you so much for that. And Lord, we thank you for this church and the direction that we are moving, Lord, to tell people about Jesus and share the gospel across our community. And Lord, just be with Harold this morning as he brings our message. And be with us as we sing and, and be with all of us as we go our ways this week and look for those opportunities. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, if you would stand with us, this is a new one, and it's a fun one. So if you weren't awake before you got here, you will be by the time the song is over. <laughs> well, good God Almighty, I hope you'll find me. Praising your name no matter what comes. Cause I know where I be. Without your mercy, I keep praising your name at the top of my lungs. Well, I can't count the times I've called your name, some broken night. And you showed up and patched me up like I forget that you keep coming around You know the way that you never let me down Good God Almighty I hope you'll find me Raising your name no matter what comes Cause I know where I'll be Without your mercy So I keep praising Sun in the morning, 
praise him in the noontime, praise him when the sun goes down. Love him in the morning, love him in the noontime, love him when the sun goes down. Praise him in the morning, praise him in the noontime, praise him when the sun goes down. Love him in the morning, love him in the noontime, love him when the sun goes down. Good God Almighty, I hope you find me praising your name. Cause I know where I'd be without your mercy So I keep praising your name at the top of my lungs Tell me is he good, tell me is he God In the morning, Jesus in the noontime, Jesus when the sun goes down. Jesus in the morning, Jesus in the noontime, Jesus when the sun goes down. Hey man, you guys have a seat. <laughs> you did well enough, we'll let you sit now. So this next song we've done a couple of times, it's called Pieces, and it's We've said before, you know, with the group of us, that it's the perfect playbook for love, and it's the definition, and it's the way that Jesus loves us, and it's not in pieces, and it's not to tease us, and it's unwavering, and it's it's amazing. Um, and it seemed fitting for Mother's Day that we would sing a song about love. Um, you know, the women who taught us how to love, the women that introduced us to Jesus. Um, so if you just think of the lyrics or read them as they go, and just remind ourselves how to love, and how to go out into the world and to be that light and to shed his love as well. Unreserved, unrestrained, your love is wild, your love is wild for me, it isn't shy, it's unashamed.
Thank you, praise team, and I'd love to invite you to join me in prayer. Father, we come this morning thanking you for your love, your love that you displayed on the cross at Calvary when Jesus stretched out his hands and allowed sinful man to drive nails, and he hung on our behalf where we know we, where we'd be without your mercy, and we'd be condemned in our sins, and yet we have found life through Jesus, and we sing and celebrate that this morning. We thank you today for the ladies here today. We pray for them. Thank you for them. Lord, I thank you for the mothers here today. And Lord, I know that in this room and listening online, there are all kinds of emotions today. Some are excited and, and some miss their mother. There are mothers who miss their children. and There are ladies who want to be mothers and just all kinds of emotions. I pray that your spirit would do your work in the hearts and lives today and bring comfort and Lord, we pray you'd give us ears to hear. Lord, as we talk about Jesus and his sacrifice for us, we pray that you would open blind eyes, that you might give life to some. Lord, what a, a blessing it would be today to see someone turn from their sins and believe upon Jesus and be saved. We pray for that this morning, and we pray that you'll be glorified today as we open your word, and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let me also say Happy Mother's Day to you. So thankful for the ladies in the church. And we took a little bit of time this week just to reflect on some of the awesome ladies that God has uh, put in my life and used in my life. I have a, a godly mother. So thankful for her. Got to see her yesterday. I have a godly wife. I'm thankful for Jenny. And I got uh, uh, a Christ loving daughter and a Christ loving daughter in law. I have uh, had great Sunday school teachers. Most of all of them were women. And uh, there are ladies who still encourage me. Some of the prayer warriors in my life are ladies and uh, just faithful servants. I, I'm so thankful for the ladies here at Burlington Baptist Church. You all have been blessed with so many awesome, awesome ladies. And so uh, God bless you. We're thankful for you. I asked the early church, uh, I started asking questions. Uh, I didn't think much about it, but I said, who's got over five children? And there was a whole bunch of them. So let me ask, anybody got over five children this morning? Ginger? All right, Ginger? All right. Oh, oh, Tom and, and Carol. Carol's got 12 children. I don't think we can, can anybody beat 12 children? <laughs> wow. Wow. So Carol, congratulations. You are the, the I don't know how to say that, but awesome. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Let me ask this. How, how many of you have been mother, a mother for over 50 years? We, we got any? Why don't y'all stand up? We want to see you. If you've been a mother for over 50 years. <laughs> Amen. Amen. How, how about this? Is it this the first Mother's Day for any? Is anybody first Mother's Day here? All right. Rihanna. Yes. How about, how about y'all just want all the ladies, all the ladies stand up. We want to see our ladies this morning. Yay. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Let me, let me ask you a question this morning. Anybody want to be used by God? Yes. All right. Yes. We got some. Uh, ladies, any ladies that want, want to be used by God? Just think about all the ladies in the Bible that God has used in special ways. There, there's all kinds of them identified in here. I, I was telling them most of our missionaries are couples, but of the singles that are international missionaries, eight out of ten are female. And uh, I, I, I guess they're just more courageous and bold and, and love Jesus more, I guess. Uh, but praise the Lord for them. So when I ask the question, anybody want to be used by God, does that, does that scare you or does that excite you or both? And, and do you quickly try to put some parameters on how uh, you want God to use you? Do, you? do you say things like, well, I'll do this, but I, I'm not going to do that, or I'll go here, but I'll, I'll never go there? 
What might God do with your life if you offered your life as a blank check to God? And you just say, God, you fill this out in regards to date and place and amount. Now, does that scare you? Listen, I, it, we're in Acts chapter 8 this morning, and uh, we read about Philip. And uh, this is a man who made his self made himself available to God, and we're going to read about one of the things that God accomplished in his life. And so I want to invite you to stand, and we're going to look at Acts uh, chapter 8, 26 through 40. And I mentioned earlier, the only thing that would be better about this is if, if it was Priscilla or somebody this morning instead of Philip. If we had a woman here, it would uh, make it better for Mother's Day. But we got Philip, and we'll take him because he was available. And so it says, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went, and there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, Go over and join the chariot, his, his chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before it, its shear is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe this, his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with the scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? Verse 38, And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Astus, and as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. And I invite you to be seated, and we'll ask the Lord to, to bless his word this morning. Uh, just a little bit of background about Philip. We first read about him in Acts chapter 6. Uh, there in the early church, uh, they realized that they were missing uh, some ministry. And some of the widows were not being cared for, especially the Greek-speaking widows. And so the apostles said, listen, we got our hands full with prayer and, and uh, the Word. And so the church, you, you look for some men who can do this ministry, uh, men filled with the Spirit. And, and so Philip is one of the seven men that the church identified in Acts chapter 6 to help meet this need. When we come to Acts chapter 8... In verse 5, we find Philip in Samaria. Uh, he went down to the city of Samaria. We were there last week with Jesus, weren't we? And uh, he proclaimed to them the Christ. And so Philip is, is telling about Jesus, preaching the good news about Jesus. And then we get to verse 26, and an angel shows up, and it says that... Uh, an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go towards the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And so the angel shows up and sends him somewhere else. And, you know, a question maybe is, is, has God ever sent you somewhere for something and you, didn't, you couldn't really figure it out until you got there and God used you in a special way to maybe minister to someone or, or maybe to share Christ with them? God sends us places sometimes to be an instrument for Him. And so before we dive deep into the, the text, uh, I want to make sure we build on the right foundation. And so my first point this morning is just to recognize that salvation is a work of God. Salvation is a work of God. If you're in Ephesians chapter 2, Paul tells us that you were dead in your trespasses and sins. That's a description of all of us apart from Christ. We're dead in trespasses and sins. Now we know that physically dead, a physically dead person doesn't respond to anything. 
uh, a spiritually dead person likewise does not respond in faith to the gospel, does not believe. And so we need God through the Holy Spirit uh, to do a work in people's lives just like he was doing in the life of this Ethiopian here in chapter 8. And so we're going to meet him this morning and we're going to see what God was doing in his life. But we got to know that salvation is a work of God. I've never saved the first person. I've had the privilege of sharing the gospel with people, and God has converted them and turned the light on, and they have responded in faith. And, and so Ephesians 2, we're dead in our trespasses, but verse 4 says, But God, being rich in mercy, we like that, don't we? God is merciful and gracious. God being rich in mercy because of the great love in which he loved us. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. He quickened our hearts. Some translations, by grace you have been saved. And so that's foundational to understand that salvation is a work of God. But secondly, realize that we can be a witness for God. We can be a messenger for God. And today, if you would like to be a witness for God, I hope you do. If you want to be a messenger, an instrument in the hand of God, then I want to tell you four things you need to do. The first one, and listen, you know all four of these, but the first one is to pray for opportunities. I believe that if you'll pray and ask God to give you opportunities, I believe, and I've experienced this, that God will give you opportunities and He will open doors for you to be able to be a witness. He will give you those opportunities. I'd encourage you to pray every morning. God, use me today. Give me opportunities today and help me. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 6, at the end of this last uh, chapter of Ephesians, uh, Paul talks about putting on the spiritual armor. And you've got the helmet, the breastplate, the shield of faith, the shoes, the belt. You've got it all. And then he says, and pray at all times. And before he ends, though, in Ephesians 6, 19, he asks the church, he says, and pray for me that words may be given me to, in opening my mouth boldly. I, I want to open my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. I want you to give me opportunities, God, and I want you to open my mouth and just help me to boldly proclaim the gospel. We, we should pray that for one another, that we would have the opportunities, and when God gives us those opportunities, that we'd be ready to share the gospel. Now, I realize that some of you are, are a little fearful and hesitant uh, when we talk about going to uh, take the gospel to every home. I know that. I, I, I hear that. I, I sense some of that. And uh, some of you, some have said, well, that's not my cup of tea. And I just want to just mention that this morning. If, what if your pastor said that uh, I, I don't like to talk to lost people? It, I don't like to go to houses. It's just not my cup of tea. Well, you'd say, well, preacher, you should. And you'd be exactly right. I should. I should want to talk to lost people, and I do want to talk to lost people, and you're, you're right about that. And, and so uh, I want to say to you that fulfilling the Great Commission, going and making disciples, is part of your responsibility if you call yourself a Christian. It's, it's, it came with it. It's, it's part of your responsibility. And you'll say, why is it? Because Jesus, if Jesus is Lord... And if you're a Christian, you, you've said he's Lord. Amen? Well, here's what he said, Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Go ye therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the ages. And so our Lord has given us what we call the Great Commission. In John chapter 20, he says, as the Father sent me, I'm going to send you. He said, I'm going to make you to become fishers of men. And... Uh, now, if you have another approach, that's great. I want to support that. If you have another way that you're fulfilling the Great Commission. But if you aren't doing anything to fulfill the Great Commission, then why don't you just participate with us? How about that? And uh, here's the reality. If you really want to be used by God, then you've got to get out of your comfort zone sometimes. Amen? Now, we, we like it where it's comfortable. And uh, going and knocking on the doors. I don't, I, there's probably not two or three of you in here that say, I'll, I'll, it's comfortable for me. It's not comfortable for me either, but I want to be used by God. Let me ask you this question. If you drove by a house that was on fire, would you go and beat on the door to try to tell the people? Let me ask that again, because I'm, I'm starting to worry about y'all. 
If you were driving by a house and you noticed it was on fire, would you stop your car and run to the door and try to notify them? Yeah. yeah. What if it's not your cup of tea? <laughs> you, you wouldn't care, would you? You, wanna, you, wanna, you want them to be saved from the fire. Listen, church, if you believe that people are going to hell apart from a relationship with Jesus, don't you want them to be rescued? Yes. And so we might have to get out of our comfort zone and go to them. But listen, we want them to be rescued. Listen, I've been pastoring for over 20 years now, and I've heard just about all the excuses, and I've used a lot of them. I have. But I hope you don't want me to allow you to be comfortable not sharing your faith. I hope you don't want me to let you be comfortable if you're not sharing your faith. I, you got the wrong preacher if that's the case. Because we're told to, to go and make this. Listen, one day i got to stand before the master and I've got to give an account for how I led you guys. Hebrews 13, 17. And I told him earlier, I, I'd rather be accountable to you than to be accountable for you. But he said, i got to be accountable for you. And so just, I'd rather rub you a little the wrong way than to stand before God and disobey him. And so uh, I'm just trying to go ahead and lay my cards on the table this morning. I'm going to give it all I can in regards to leading you to do what the Bible tells you to do. And when it comes to taking up money for our missionaries, I'm going to push. And you guys respond like crazy to that. And when it comes to taking the gospel to every home, I'm going to push. And I, I know you're going to respond to that. And I'm going to push you, church, because I love Jesus first. And I'm going to push you because I love you. And I want you to stand before Jesus one day saying, I, I tried to do that great commission. I, I tried to go, and I, I wanted to be faithful in that. And I, I want you to, to stand before him as, as uh, faithful to the great commission. Now listen, I confessed something earlier. I, I say this with a sad heart. I'm not as evangelistic as I used to be. And, uh, you know, I'm reminded in a time of my life where I tried to look for an opportunity to talk about Jesus everywhere I went. And I, I had a go one time of, of having a gospel conversation every day. And so sometimes later on, I had to maybe to go to Kroger. So I'd have to look for somebody maybe because I, I wanted to talk about to someone about Jesus. Listen, and so pray that, that God would renew that in me, that God would give me those opportunities and that, uh, that I'd be faithful to look for those. And so pray for me. Would you, would you pray for me that I'll have more gospel opportunities? Is anybody, will you do that? Will you put me on your list? Thank you. And, and listen, one of the reasons that 70 to 80% of our churches are plateaued or declining and we're baptizing less each year, we quit fishing. We quit fishing for men. It's not that the, the harvest isn't plentiful. The harvest is plentiful, amen? The labors are few. The, the harvest is ripe unto, the fields are ripe unto harvest, but the labors are few. And listen, if you don't, plan on being a laborer, then at least pray for those who will. And please don't be a stumbling block. Don't whine about the church trying to go door to door and take the gospel. Don't, don't be that kind of person. But pray for, for laborers. And pray for laborers to go out with the gospel. And some of you have been doing that. We're on day 29, I think. And we've been praying for 40 days that God would send out laborers. And so I'm praying for you that God would raise you up and send you out there. Keep doing that. And, and pray for the lost. At least, church, at least be praying for your one. Now, we started talking about that last January, and, and I hope you're still praying for that one. I hope you're still looking for opportunities. And listen, I, I can't help but think that some of us has quit on that because if you pray and look for opportunities for a year and a half, you, we would have seen more of our ones be saved, I, I think. And so pray. Uh, and it's think we could say that, that Philip was a man with zeal for sharing the gospel. So we find him here in chapter 8, verse 5. He's sharing the gospel in Samaria. And by the time we get to Acts 21, they're, they're referring to Philip as Philip the evangelist. I mean, it was what he did. And so maybe we should pray that God would give some of us such a zeal for sharing the gospel that it becomes a part of who we are. We're gospel people. I want us to be a, a gospel conversational church, a church that looks for opportunities to tell people about Jesus. I, I want that for you. So not only should we pray for opportunities, but number two, submit to God's promptings. 
Now, Philip was busy in Samaria sharing the gospel, but when the angel appears to him and says, verse 26, go towards the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza, this is a desert place. Uh, there were two roads from Jerusalem south to Gaza, and one of them was seldom used, and the angel says, go, to, go on that one. The desert place. And, and sometimes God sends us to a desert place. The good news, if he sends us there, then he has a purpose for us when we get there. And so although this request was a little unusual, God was working out his plan to bring salvation. And the fact that Philip ran into this Ethiopian was not an accident or coincidence. It wasn't even some human genius it was the work of God. God was at work, and Philip was about to be part of a divine encounter. You ever been a part of a divine encounter? You ever been, you ever, God's used you, at, there's been this divine appointment, and God has you at the right place at the right time, and he's already working in someone's heart, and you, you get there, and you just get to share the good news, and man, I've seen that before. I, I've seen it before where that they're, they're, they're ready, and you know it when you get there. And God just kind of brings you along to, to be a part of it, and it's awesome. And Jesus said in John 6, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And he was certainly doing that to this Ethiopian. So before we can be used as a witness or a messenger for God, we must submit our will to his. And so we see Philip do that. Verse 27, he rose and went. Church, if you tell God you want to be used, then you've got to submit to His promptings. And you've got to go where He leads, and you've got to go when He leads. And so I suspect that He is prompting most of you to, to participate in taking the gospel to every home. And I, I told somebody, I, I can't imagine anybody praying and the Holy Spirit uh, tell you no. I don't want you to participate in this Great Commission work. Somebody might slam the door in your face, so don't do it. I can't imagine. You, you can take me up on that, and you can ask God if, if he thinks you should participate in taking the gospel, but I'm pretty sure what he's going to say, because uh, he's already spoken. And he said, go. And he says, while you go, make disciples. And so uh, submit to his prompting. Number three, rely upon the word of God. Now, this Ethiopian was already reading the scriptures. He was in the book of Isaiah when Philip came upon him. And I, I gave a disclaimer at the first service. That that's probably not going to happen when we go out. And somebody's probably not coming to the door, packing their Bible and saying, Ah, oh, I'm so glad you're here. I was just reading here and I need some. You, that, that might not happen when we go out. They, they might not come with the Bible open. And, uh, but that's okay. Uh, so this Ethiopian, let's, let's a little bit about him. Verse 27, he was a, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. So he had a pretty high position, didn't he? he in modern terms, he was kind of the secretary of the treasury or the, the minister of finance. And what we know is that God was stirring his heart and God was opening his eyes and he was seeking the one true and living God. We, we call that a God fear. And it says there at the end that he had come to Jerusalem to worship. So God's already doing something in his heart. And then we get 28. Uh, he was returning. He was in his chariot. He was reading the prophet Isaiah. The spirit said to Philip, go over there and join his chariot. And so Philip ran to him. And he heard him reading Isaiah the prophet, and he asked, Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, How can I unless someone guides me? Now, I've mentioned uh, if you read Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, you'll you, you probably have a little bit of trouble understanding sometimes. And uh, we, we had the Spirit to help us. But uh, this Ethiopian, he needed a little bit of help. And so he said, How can I understand this? And, uh, and so Philip uh, comes up there and... Uh, he in, comes and sits down with him. The passage of Scripture they was reading, this is Isaiah 53, 7 and 8. Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, like a lamb before his shear is silent, so he opens not his mouth. Now we know that Isaiah is writing about Jesus, but he didn't understand that. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe this generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. 
Uh, so verse 37, in humiliation, justice was denied him. We, we know that th that's a picture of Jesus. He, he didn't get a fair trial. He stood before Pilate condemned already. And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? And Philip opened his mouth, beginning with the scriptures, he told him the good news about Jesus. Uh, Philip was probably amazed that, uh, at what God was doing. Philip was probably amazed he got there and, and uh, here's a Gentile who is reading the scriptures. He, he's trying to understand the word of God and uh, it, it would be like uh, going to lunch today and, and someone coming to your table and saying, hey, uh, I see you're from Burlington Baptist. Could you tell me how to be saved? And we would be like, well, yes, I can. That would be, it would be kind of like that. And so Philip, uh, he's invited to explain the scriptures. And, uh, and again, the, the confusion is understandable. We know that Isaiah 53 is, is the suffering servant of Jesus. And that he would be wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement that we deserve was upon him. And by his we, we know that's all about Jesus. He, he, he became sin. We, all we like sheep had gone astray. And God laid on him the iniquity of us all. That, that whole psalm is about Jesus who would come and suffer. And so Jesus would be the sheep led to the slaughter. The sheep that doesn't open his mouth. And you now some thought maybe uh, Isaiah was talking about the nation of Israel. Well, some thought maybe he was talking about himself. Some thought maybe he was talking about the Messiah. And Philip was knowledgeable enough in the scriptures uh, to meet the eunuch where he was, answer his questions, and then share the good news about Jesus. And so, church, listen, we, we want to be proficient in the scriptures uh, so that we can meet people where they are and we can lead them to Christ. We, we want to do what Paul uh, Peter said in 1 Peter 3.15. We want to be ready. Always be ready to give an answer or be ready to give a defense for the hope that we have in Christ. We, we want to be able to explain to people why we have put our faith in Jesus. And, and so, uh, so many people use this as an excuse. And they say, well, I don't know enough. And I try to tell people, if you know enough to be saved, you know enough. You know that in your sins you were separated from God. You know that, don't you? Yeah, and you know what Jesus did? He came and he lived a sinless life and then he went to the cross and on the cross he became sin for us and he died in our place, you know that? And he died and on the third day he arose again. You know that and he invites people to turn from their sins and believe upon Jesus. You know enough to tell someone else how to be saved. But listen, if it bothers you that you don't know more, then dive in here, okay? And quit using that as an excuse. Listen, there are Bible study groups that will help you. There is more body, Bible study material than in the history of the world. It's, it's everywhere. You can find stuff that will help you know more about the Word of God. And Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes from hearing and hearing through the Word of Christ. Listen, church, there is power in this Word. Get in there. It's living and active. It goes out and it accomplishes its purposes. We see that here in Acts chapter 8. God is doing His work through the Word of God. And so rely upon the Word of God. Now you say, where do I start? Lots of places. You're, you're, many of you are familiar with the Romans Road. Maybe some of you were led down the Romans Road when you got saved. Or you can get Romans Road bookmarks. You, you can Google Romans Road if you want to, but that's a good place to start. Just Maybe you can mark some of these verses. It, it, it starts with just recognizing that we're a sinner. The, the first step in the Romans Road is for man to know he's a sinner. So Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're sinners. We've sinned. We've done things that displease God. We've tried to do it our way instead of God's way. God is holy, and our sin has separated us from God and so the first step down the Romans road is to admit you're a sinner and then Romans 6 23 tells us that there are some consequences for our sin for the wages of sin is death the wages or the punishment that we have earned for our sin is death 
and, and not just physical death, but, but I'm talking about eternal death. Listen, we, we know we're all going to face physical death. Hebrews 9, 27, it's appointed that a man wants to die, and after that, the judgment. And so we're going to, to die, but for those who die without a relationship with Jesus Christ, they're also going to face spiritual death. That means that we're going to be separated from God for all eternity. The Bible teaches that there is a real place of torment, a place where the fire is not quenched, where the worm dieth not, a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's called hell. And it's where we go for our sins, apart from Christ. And so the second step of the Romans road is just understand that we deserve death for our sins. But then we get to get back to Romans 6.23. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God, a free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And church, that's the good news, that salvation is a free gift from God. You, you can never earn it. You certainly don't deserve it. But God offers it freely. You've got to receive it. Romans 5, 8 tells us that God shows His love towards us, that even while we're sinners, Christ died for us. And so when Christ died on the cross, He died to pay sin's penalty. He took our sins. He died in our place. And on the third day, He arose from the grave. And His resurrection proves that the Father accepted the sacrifice of His Son as a payment for our sin. Romans 10, 9 says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. And so because of Jesus' death on our behalf, if we believe in Him, Romans 10, 9, with our heart. And we trust His death as payment for our sins will be saved. And Romans 10, 13 ensures us that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And so Jesus did all the work. He paid the penalty for our sins. He offers us salvation. He offers us forgiveness of our sins. He offers that to anyone who will come in repentance, turning from their sins and faith. And then Romans 5, 1, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we've been saved by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. When we come through faith, we are saved and we are brought into peace with God through Jesus. And so, church, we're justified by faith, we're made right with God, we're, our sins are forgiven, and now we have a relationship of peace with God. And, and then Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Anybody like that one? Yeah. We don't have to stand in judgment for our sins because Jesus stood in our place. He shed His blood to cover our sins. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And then we have these precious promises in Romans 8, 38 and 39. Paul says, For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor heights nor depths nor any other created thing is able to separate us from the love of God in Christ. I'm convinced, Paul said, that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And so listen, church, the, the gospel is Bible-centered. We, man didn't come up with this. We get it from the Word of God. So Acts 8.35, Philip opened his mouth and beginning with Scripture. He, he began with the Scriptures. Listen, our presentation of the Gospel should be based solidly on the Scriptures. And then it says, beginning with Scriptures, he told him the good news about Jesus. And so the Gospel is not only Bible-centered, but it's Christ-centered. It's the good news about Jesus. And so the Lamb in Isaiah 53 was speaking about Jesus, the Messiah, who would be the ultimate and final sacrifice for our sins. And so if we want to be used by God, listen, pray for opportunities, submit to His promises, rely upon the Word of God, and fourthly, trust God for the results. This is where we can sigh a little bit. We, we trust God for the results. We, we pray God prepares the hearts. 
We present the gospel, and we trust God for the results. Jonah 2, 9, salvation belongs to the Lord. Listen, Philip just made himself available, and he shared the good news of Jesus. And, and what was the results? Well, there, there was faith. Apparently, this Ethiopian uh, manifested saving faith, and Philip talked to him about baptism. Uh, Philip knew that faith was required. So verse 36, and they were going along the road. They came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? Now, verse 37 is not in the ESV Bible because as they studied manuscripts, the oldest, most reliable manuscripts did not have verse 37. I have a footnote in it. It says, Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may... And he replied, I believe that Jesus Christ, that, that, that is an expression of faith. And that is necessary for salvation. And so we believe that. We believe that a scribe added that in because it sounded like he just went and got baptized without expressing his faith. And so Philip talked to him about a relationship with Jesus. Uh, Philip knew that faith was required, and so it is likely, it, it had to be that he expressed his faith in Jesus, and then he said, there's water, and so why don't I go get baptized? And so secondly, there was a confession of faith. Notice verse 38. And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water. They're going to baptize by immersion. We, we believe that's the way you're supposed to do it. Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Now, church, listen. Baptism is the public confession of faith. And it is the public confession of faith that is expected for every believer. We believe in our hearts. We acknowledge Jesus as Lord, but we publicly confess Jesus as Lord through baptism. And so not only did he publicly uh, confess his faith in Jesus, but he openly was baptized in front of this entourage because he wanted them to know that he was a follower of Jesus. And so if you're a follower of Jesus, you should be baptized to say to the world, I'm a follower of Jesus. It's like a wedding ring, but I want people to know that I'm married to that lady over there. Baptism is our way of saying, I want the world to know that I am a follower of Jesus. And then at the end of verse 38, he went, or end of verse 39, he went on his way rejoicing. There was rejoicing. Church, listen, joy is a mark of every true believer. This Ethiopian eunuch went on his way rejoicing. And that should be the response of every new believer. That should be the response of the church every time somebody believes. Uh, you know, some people come up out of the baptismal waters, and some of you go, mm -hmm, not me. Man, somebody comes and trusts Jesus. Man, if I'm able to get up, I'm going to get up on my feet, and I'm going to give him some praise because somebody's acknowledging Jesus as Lord, and they, they've been rescued from, from darkness and brought into the light. They, they've been brought to Jesus, and so we ought to get a little bit excited about that. Jim's got one that trusted Jesus last week. I bet you when he gets to Texas, he's going to get a little excited down there. That, that ought to be the response when someone is, is saved and follow the Lord in, in believers' baptism. And listen, every time somebody responds to, to the good news of Jesus, it's a time to celebrate and rejoice. There's a party in heaven, and there can be a party here on earth. And well, I hope we can party this morning because someone trusts in Jesus. And then Philip's on his way to the next assignment, to this place called Azotus. As he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. And so he just kept preaching. Listen, th th this isn't a story about Philip. This isn't a story about me or you. It's, it's about the gospel of Jesus Christ and its power to save people. And so let me just briefly summarize and we'll be done. First of all, recognize that salvation is a work of God. Realize that we can be a witness for God. And listen, church, that's all we ask of us. I'm not responsible for the results. I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to preach for them. I'm going to do all I can to make the gospel clear, but, but he's got to bring the results. And so, listen, God does the preparing, and we leave that up to him and his timing. We do the presenting. 
We, we, we pray, we submit to his promptings, we open the word, we share Jesus, and we trust him for the results. And then man must respond in faith. And when they respond, they should be baptized, and there should be lots of rejoicing. And so wouldn't it, wouldn't it be awesome to see all three of those this morning? God moving in our midst. The gospel presented, and now some of you have an opportunity to respond in faith. And listen, you know the enemy says, oh, well, they're going to think, no, no, that's not true. Listen, when you respond in faith, the, the church responds in rejoicing. Because that's what we do, what we do. We want to share the gospel. We want you to respond, and we'll celebrate with you this morning. Let's pray. Father, I pray that there might be someone here this morning that you've stared their hearts, that you prepared them. You, you woke them up this morning. You, you brought them here. Maybe they just come to be with their mother or countless other reasons, but I, I pray that you've prepared their hearts and they have come and they've heard the good news of, of Jesus. They've heard about this offer to be saved, that Jesus took their sins and stood in our place, and that through faith we can have our sins forgiven. I, I pray that that would be understandable to some this morning, and that maybe for the first time there will be someone this morning who says, you know, I believe in Jesus, and I just want to publicly declare my faith in Jesus. Father, we pray you would save someone this morning. And we would rejoice with them. And Father, I pray that you might raise up a, some Phillips in this room. Some men and women who just say, God, I want to be used by you. And God, I'll go wherever you send me. And if you'll help me, I'll share the good news. And it, it might not be in our comfort zone. It, it probably won't be. But I pray you'd raise some up who just says, God, I'm, I'm willing to be an instrument. Send me. Send me. Father, I pray there'd be a response this morning to your word. And we'll give you the praise for it. And we'll celebrate it this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you stand and listen, it's, it's your turn. Uh, the Ethiopian eunuch, he knew what he was going to do. He said, uh, Man, I want Jesus, and I want to be baptized. Listen, Jesus loves you, died for you. Would you respond in faith this morning? And if you have questions, I would love to try to answer them. I'd love to tell you about Jesus. And uh, if you want to respond in some other way, if, if the Lord's called you to ministry or to just be faithful with the gospel, I, if you want me to pray, I'd love to pray with you. If you want to partake of the Lord's Supper this morning, you do that. But just listen, it's a time to respond. And listen, the church will celebrate your obedience this morning. Oh, I heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I heard ten. A whisper of love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father.
seated and uh miss connie would you come down here first this is connie kissa tisa, tisa. Lisa, with lisa with the t thank you that's right that's what she said but uh, miss connie comes this morning she's been coming for several weeks and uh, she'd like to be a part she feels like god has sent her here and this is uh worse god wants her to be a part of a church and so <laughs> amen. we welcome you miss connie and uh, Miss Connie comes from Erlanger Baptist, and uh, welcome. And some of you maybe have introduced. Have you been to the ladies' Bible study on Monday and Mondays? All right, met some of those ladies. And so, uh, by by clapping, we we acknowledge uh, our desire for you to be a part of our family, and we want to love and encourage you. And so, uh, you know, we used to have people come by and shake hands. We we can't really do that right now, but but you all know Connie now, and. Uh, you all get to know Connie and, and love her as part of our church, and we want to say welcome to you. She, she gave a testimony of faith and baptism, and, uh, and so we're excited for you. Thank you. Thank Amen. You. Thank you, Miss Connie. I'll get that one. Y'all can come up here. So this is Brian and Danielle Cobb. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> you know him. Yeah. Uh, and they have a daughter, Hannah. That's Hannah back there. And uh, they've been coming since November, and uh, Brian just shared that uh, he would like to, to have a church family and uh, this Catholic background. And uh, so I'm going to meet with him and Hannah and, and Danielle this week and just talk to them about faith and being a part of a church and baptism and what all that looks like. Uh, but I want you all to, to know them, the Cobbs. And uh, did, did we share about your service? And uh, Brian's been diagnosed with some PTSD. And uh, we just wants to look to Jesus, and uh, we think that's the best advice. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. All right, so Brian and Danielle and Hannah, and uh, we'll be talking to them. We might get them to come back down and share uh, what God's doing in their lives, but uh, we're thankful that God's brought you here, and uh, we want to love and encourage you guys and, and uh, look forward to doing that. And uh, so... Uh, thank you all for coming today. I, I hope you have a great uh, Mother's Day. I, I want to just put in a plug here. I got this cool shirt that uh, I wore last week. You remember that? Uh, the Gospel to Every Home. If you'll sign up for a time to go out with us, uh, one of the it asks a couple questions. It asks uh, if there's a particular date that you want to go out with us. We're going to start before Bible school. So uh, it asks if you feel comfortable being a leader or if you'd just rather be a participant. Uh, we're not going to send anybody out there by themselves. Uh, we'll have teams, 
Uh, and so if you feel like leading a team, just let us know. If you want some evangelism training, uh, we're going to schedule a whole bunch of that in the next few weeks. And then it asks you what shirt size you wear. And uh, we'd love for you to have a shirt uh, to go out with us. And so please do that this week so we can get them ordered. And uh, that'll be exciting. And uh, is that it, Danny? That's it. All right, brother. Well, before I go, I have something. Um, one of my team is graduating today. And all of her family's back there. So Holly's graduations today. All her folks are back there. So we're proud of her. She said she's got some breathing room now, so she's going to be in good shape. But uh, let's pray together. Lord, we just thank you so much for this opportunity uh, to just, just be together. Lord, thank you for the additions to our church, Lord, and just, just continually growing us. Lord, help us to be responsible with that growth and help us to be good leaders for that. And Lord, help us to just be energized as we go out and try to tell people about the gospel. Um, Lord, we just thank you so much for that commission. Lord, help us to do with it what we can do. We thank you so much for your son, Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.